Okay, um, I think we'll get started now. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for, for joining us today. This is one of our uh, virtual uh, public uh, talks slash panels um, that we run as part of uh, both Physics Matters and Astro McGill, two of the uh, outreach groups in the McGill Physics Department. And I especially want to thank all of you for showing up tonight. It's been a lot of things happening in the world right now. Um, and hopefully we can um, distract from that a little bit, uh, talk about some interesting things. But either way, we really appreciate you joining us tonight. Um, so I'm Adrian Liu. Um, I'm a faculty member at, uh, at McGill here. Um, in the physics department. I'll be your host today. Um, and today we are very happy to have uh, four panelists, all of whom are theoretical physicists in various different areas. Um, so we've got four um, here just uh, in order of um, their little intro spiels. Um, we have uh, Professor Jim Klein, um, followed by uh, Am An Khoi Trin, who's a graduate student in our department. Uh, and then Professor Sarah Harrison, who is a professor in both mathematics and physics here. Um, and finally, Professor Eve Lee, um, who's an astrophysicist um, here again at McGill. Um, and so the way this will work is that we are on the Zoom platform right now. So there are a number of you um, signed in on the Zoom platform. We also have um, a lot of people watching the live streams on Facebook. Um, if you are on the Zoom platform and you would like to ask a question, and we're leaving most of our time for questions because we found that people are very curious and that's what we want to get to, um, you can either type them into the chat um, or type them into the Q&A box. If you are on our Facebook live stream, you can just comment on the live stream, um, as, just like you would comment on any other post. Um, and we have people... Uh, watching those and we will basically funnel all the questions through me um, and I'll pose them to the panelists. Um, so without further ado, um, Jim, why don't you take it away and give your little quick um, intro to you and your research. All right, great, thank you, Adrian. Um, normally I do particle physics uh, combined with cosmology, but uh, Today, I'm going to tell you a story about something that happened to me, and it was uh, only about particle physics. And it took place in Copenhagen. I was visiting there uh, for an extended visit in 2015. That's a view from the apartment that I had. Uh, and it's a wonderful, inspiring place. Uh, great cycling there, which I love to do. And it's inspiring for physics, too. I was visiting the Niels Bohr Institute. And at that time, there was this experimental puzzle that I got interested in. It was about B quarks decaying. Uh, these are heavy partners to lighter quarks. Uh, and B quarks like to decay into charm quarks. And then they might decay into an electron and its antineutrino. Um, but uh, of course, electrons, they have their heavier cousins, muons and taus. And so all of three of these kind of decays happen an interesting thing in the standard model, they should all happen with almost exactly the same probability up to small effects of the different masses. And what was going on is that the experiments measuring this one into taus were finding that it was too small. So that was very curious. And at the same time, I noticed some other uh, peculiarities involving the same particles. Like there was this one uh, bound state of an up and a, a bottom quark which when it would decay to taus, it gave too big a prediction compared to uh, what you would expect and compared to the other lighter uh, electron-like particles. Okay, so B tau, once again, something funny going on. And then this W boson decaying into taus, that was also coming out too big. And so it's kind of suggestive that maybe there's something going on involving tau particles and B particles, and, and maybe we could um, describe all of these problems in a unified way. And so at the time I was thinking, could it be an extra Higgs boson that's doing this? And uh, if it was an extra Higgs boson, it would come in a, a pair of a neutral and charged Higgs bosons. Uh, and this charged one, 
is the one that we would like to help us explain all these things. The neutral one comes along for the ride. Anyway, if you have this charge Higgs, then what you could do is you could put it in the place everywhere there was a W boson in these diagrams. You could put it in the place of the W and it would be appearing as an extra contribution on top of the standard model contribution. And uh, then one of these would have to make a bigger, uh, a relatively negative contribution to make this whole thing smaller. This one would have to make a relatively positive contribution to make the whole thing bigger. That looks a little funny, but I figured out a clever way to make that work out. And so I was very happy with that. And, uh, and I could explain all three of these anomalies if it turned out, so when you put in the numbers, it turned out it would work, but only if these new particles, these new Higgs bosons were pretty light, like of order the Higgs boson that was already discovered and the W boson. And that's kind of shocking to think that there could be extra particles out there that are that light because naively we think those um, masses have been covered by the experiments searching for them and uh, they, they shouldn't be there. So that would be kind of surprising. And also if these particles were around, they could screw up all sorts of other predictions. And so at first I thought, oh, no way this could work. But when I started looking more closely, I discovered that all the searches that should have discovered these particles could just barely have missed them because they have somewhat different properties than people assume. And then all those other processes where the particle, new particle doesn't show up directly, it's an indirect effect that would screw up some well-measured process like Z decaying into tau particles. Turned out that this could be barely consistent with what, what's observed. And so, Time after time, I thought something's going to kill this theory. And I found out, no, it's not killing it. It's still working in it. And I got very excited. And also because my theory was predicting some new things that experimentalists could look for and uh, test the theory in the near future. So uh, at this point, I started working late into the night, which is it's not something I always do. I have other interests in life, and I'm not uh, really a work addict. But I got so excited about this theory that I couldn't put it down until it was done. And finally, when I convinced myself everything works, I wrote this paper, I got it published. There was one funny thing about this. Uh, you know, we like to put acknowledgments to the people we talked to and discussed with. I put in an acknowledgement to uh, Mila Huskat here. Uh, Huskat, that's a fake name. Uh, in Danish, it means uh, domestic cat. And uh, Mila was this, uh, beautiful cat that I was going to visit on the weekends at an animal shelter and uh, trying to help her get adopted, which she did. And uh, my girlfriend's still bitter that I acknowledged the cat and not her for encouragement. Anyway, so that was my exciting experience. And uh, now you're probably wondering, well, did the experimentalists find uh, those things that I was predicting and did I get the Nobel Prize? Well, Actually, what happened was there was one, I thought I checked everything, but there was one process I forgot about. There was this one particle of a, a B in an anti-charm quark. And that's one of those things that gets messed up and nothing saves it. Uh, my theory predicts that this is the wrong value compared to what's observed. And so it ruled out my beautiful theory. Well, that's par for the course for a theoretical physicist. And uh, so I wasn't too disappointed, but the interesting thing in this case was this is one case where I actually started to believe that maybe my theory was describing physical reality. And that's why I got so excited. And, and this is the really the sort of thing that makes uh, physics exciting for me. So uh, that's my story. And uh, I'll uh, let the next person take over. Great, thank you, Jim. Um, and Koi, would you like to follow up? Yep, sure. All right. Um, yeah. Thanks, Adrian, and the rest of the outreach committee for organizing this. And thanks, uh, Jim, for going first and having giving me a brief introduction, <laughs> the audience a brief introduction to particle physics. Um, so I decided to first start my presentation with um, more of who I am and how I got here. So um, I was born here in Quebec. And after CEGEP, nearing the end of my CEGEP, I didn't quite know what I wanted to do, but I knew it was between engineering and physics. And basically, out of a toss of a coin, I basically just ended up in physics because at the time I thought I wanted to do something 
work at the cutting edge of research. Um, so when I started undergrad, I worked mostly in experimental physics labs where I worked in particle physics and I also worked in engineering physics, uh, solar cells. Um, so my journey to theoretical physics was actually very long because for me, it started when I was learning about quantum physics where it was confusing to me because having been brought up with more of the experimental physics perspective, I was motivated to see what I wanted to, the equations that were before me. But quantum physics is more abstract. It's a bit harder to experience it based on our intuition. And when I learned about gravity, it further, it was even more confusing. So for me, what clarified everything was when I started diving into the math. When I started looking into the mathematical equations, all my intuition and understanding of physics became clear. And that's eventually how I found myself into uh, theoretical physics. So in the past, I've given talks about string theory for these public outreach, but today I wanted to actually talk about what my research is instead of talking about the framework that I talked about, because I believe Sarah will probably talk a bit more on this, uh, on the string theory side. So to understand the bootstrap, um, so in Jem's talk, he talked a bit about particle physics where he, drew, he had these diagrams of particles coming in and out. The basic idea of these diagrams is that imagine you have two objects colliding and then they fly off. And you can ask, what is the probability that I observe something out of some input? So, you know, a quick example is imagine you have two cars crashing into each other. What is the probability that I observe a number of screws flying off? So the basic idea from particle physics is that you can basically break down every such interaction and every interaction around us based on these funny diagrams where here you would imagine as one particle coming in and breaking up into two pieces like a particle decay or something more like this, like a billiards ball interaction where two balls would hit and then they fly off. So historically, people would be interested in computing the probability of measuring something. So this would be something like a five to one amplitude, which is to say the probability of observing something after you have, if you have a total of five gluons. In pure English, you can think about this as what is, what happens if I have five objects hitting each other at a singular point? Um, so, you can decompose this interaction. If you had a camera and you filmed this interaction and you had a lot of small, tiny time frames, you would able to distinguish that even though you have five objects hitting each other, you can actually break it down into pairs so that you have two objects hitting each other first, then they hit a third one, and then they hit the fourth and fifth pairs. And then in principle, well, how you do this calculation is you actually have to consider all the combinations of this possibility. So to make this more concrete, let's think about you know, real people. And let's just think about five random names. For instance, Courtney, Tim, Chloe, Kendall, and Kylie. So imagine in this diagram, what this signif means is that Courtney and Kim are actually headbutting each other first. The momentum of this combined entity will then move on to hit Chloe, which then hits Kendall and Kylie. And this is the possibility of inverting Kim and Courtney and here, um, Kim and Chloe. So in other words, what this calculation does is, what can I observe if these five people clash into each other? And you have to add up all the combinations of the possible outcomes. If you do this in physics, there's a dictionary. Each of these diagrams has an explicit mathematical symbol associated with it. With it, and then you add them all up, you have an equation. And back in the 80s, if you do this carefully, you have pages of this, which is very long and tedious. But if you power through and you actually complete the calculation, the answer is surprisingly simple. And that's basically the motivation for the bootstrap. Somehow in our intuition of the world as deconstructing in terms of point vertices interactions, we introduced a lot of complexity in our problem, which made, but the answer at the end is very simple. So then the bootstrap is basically the, the program to try and 
arrive to these results in a much faster way. So the bootstrap philosophy can be summarized in three points. What are the underlying necessary fundamental laws of nature? What are the mathematical manifestations and interpretations? And then are they sufficient to uniquely describe physical processes? So take this result, for instance. What are the underlying principles? It turns out that there are only two, unitarity and causality. And they are both intrinsic to our understanding of other empirical evidence beforehand. And so in other words, if you gave a group of physicists, force them into a room and give them free coffee and pizza, and you told them that you only have to work with unitarity and causality, in the end, they would finally arrive to this unique conclusion. There's only one possibility. And so the bootstrap program is precisely trying to identify these, these um, principles and then carry over the, the consequences of these principles. So let's take another quick example. There's a principle called crossing symmetry. You don't need to know what it is physically, but mathematically, it's described by this equation. So to have a sense of what this means, let's think of an analogy. Let's, think, let's say that I have a child and I want to name my child. In principle, I can choose any string of letters to create a name, but most people will use you know, their place of origin, their culture to use either names that are related to, that they feel more closely related. But in principle, you could choose any strings of letters or numbers if you're Elon Musk. But then you can further constrain yourself if to the set of palindromes, the set of names that are spelled the same words as backwards. And you can see that this is very constraining. For example, my name cannot be written as the same way as forwards as backwards. If I've learned anything from The Simpsons, it's that Otto is a palindrome. And in fact, here on this panel, Eve is a name is a palindrome. So you can really think of this as a constraint on the possible equations describing um, this principle. So we can test this. Let's test this equation, z plus z squared. You take it's one minus z, so you place this one by one minus z, this one by this, and then you expand. And then you realize that this equation isn't the same as the first, and therefore this equation isn't possible. Now you can test this one. And of course, you can see immediately that this equation is manifestly um, crossing symmetric because if you just replace it, then they map to each other. So this is an example of an equation that works. So the bootstrap philosophy really is you identify some principle, you interpret that in terms of some equation, and you try to get to the final result faster than what the mechanical procedure that is currently used in most graduate level textbooks. So I've talked a lot about the procedure, but I haven't actually talked about the systems that we study. And considering the time, I won't, but I'll just flash here a few systems that do, that we, where we can apply this methodology. And I hope that this provides some insight about what I actually work on on a daily basis. Great, thank you very much. Um, shall we move on to Sarah, if you're ready? Yes, uh, one second. Okay, so I'm gonna give a very brief and high level introduction. Um, so, but before uh, I uh, say about my research, I just wanna thank Adrian for organizing and all of you for coming, uh, as well as Jim and Ankoy for giving those beautiful introductions to uh, some aspects of particle physics, quantum field theory, and the conformal bootstrap. Um, so as Adrian said, I'm a professor who's joint between the mathematics and physics department at McGill. Um, and since I'm anticipating that you guys will want a lot of questions and interactions, I'm not going to describe any research problem that I work on in too much detail, but give you kind of a general philosophy of what, what my research involves. Um, and hopefully from what you've heard about from Ankoy and, and Jim, you, you have some kind of idea about the kind of physical side of what I do because it's uh, somewhat closely related. Um, so the general motivation of my research um, is I'm a physicist by training. Um, so I'm 
uh, ultimately interested in understanding quantum field theory and quantum gravity. Uh, so I'm motivated by physics, um, but kind of the aspects of, of these fields that I'm looking at are uh, trying to understand the mathematics sort of as Ankoy described that underlies basic principles of these theories. So what are the mathematical structures that are lie at the heart of quantum field theory and quantum gravity? Um, and this links um, basic problems in physics to deep questions in a variety of mathematical fields. And so on the mathematics side, I sort of work, uh, I have like uh, some working with a range of areas of mathematics um, from things like group theory, uh, geometry and topology, number theory and representation theory. Um, and there's kind of a deep and long history of interaction, um, obviously, between mathematics and physics. Uh, calculus is perhaps the example that most people are familiar with. So uh, Newton essentially, well, I don't know if you want to say he discovered calculus, but he, he definitely developed a lot of the tools of calculus when he was trying to describe basic physics and classical mechanics. Um, but even in the modern era, some of these more abstract fields of mathematics uh, turn out to be intimately related to, um, to physics. Um, and for example, if you were to go and follow um, the subject of, uh, of the conformal bootstrap that Ankoy mentioned, a lot of interesting mathematical structures um, um, arise when you impose simple uh, physical principles like crossing symmetry. Um, and so I just want to sort of list uh, a number of questions that link uh, topics between mathematics and physics that I've thought about in the past um, and I'm currently thinking about. So one example um, is if we can use the idea of symmetry to classify physical phenomena. And this can be anywhere from things like condensed matter systems where you have a bunch of atoms on a lattice and use the symmetry, the spatial symmetry of the theory but it can be more sophisticated things like um, crossing symmetry or, um, or symmetries of strains and exotic groups that um, exist in mathematics to try and understand um, what physical observables are, what you can measure in different contexts. Uh, a second question is if there are uh, simple models of quantum gravity um, and this connects in particular to string theory and something, if you've heard about the ADS CFT correspondence, I think it was briefly on Ankoy's last slide. Um, this is a simple model of quantum gravity. It doesn't describe our universe. It describes a, a universe where the space is uh, high, negatively curved. Um, but it's a model in which you can use a lot of techniques uh, and uh, principles of symmetry to compute things about thing about uh, the physics of uh, particles interacting, um, particles coupled to gravity, and even black holes. Um, and then on the mathematical side, part of my research uh, involves if we can use the connection between physics and math, um, not just use the math to predict things about the structure of phys physical theories, but if we can use physics to make predictions about mathematics itself. So sometimes um, if, if there uh, are two very different areas of mathematics, but they're both linked to physics in some way. Um, and the physics tells you that the two areas of mathematics uh, in fact have a deep connection to each other, which you wouldn't know about if you were a mathematician and only knew the math mathematical theories. Um, and so uh, one motivation of my research is if we can use physics to um, build new connections, which are surprising from a mathematical point of view between different areas of mathematics. And can this lead us to new or deep mathematical theorems that you wouldn't necessarily think about if you were a mathematician. Um, and so I think I don't wanna get into anything more technical. Uh, that's all I wanna say uh, today and hope to interact more with questions. Great. Um, so Sarah, we actually already have a question for you. Um, okay. <laughs> this just came in, which is, what does it feel like to work in both, you know, the math department and the physics department? What's that like to work in two different departments? And are there 
uh, mathematical research topics um, that you are involved in that are purely, you know, for math and, and not for physics in any way? Um, so it's very similar in a sense mm -hmm. to work in, um, in the math department versus the physics department in a lot of ways. Um, the, the group I'm part of in the physics department is the theoretical high energy physics group. So that involves Jim and Ankoy and a number of other professors. Um, and we all do theoretical research and theoretical research involves um, on a day-to-day -day basis, a lot of reading, a lot of discussing with colleagues, um, a lot of thinking and, and trying out um, calculations either on pen and paper or, or simple things on your computer. And that's pretty much the same in both math and in physics. Um, but the benefit of being involved in both departments, I guess, is that I have to double the set of colleagues to talk to um, about things that I'm interested in. Uh, as for whether, um, uh, I think the second part was whether I do anything purely from a mathematical point of view. I mean, um, with no connection to physics, um, I, I would say I've never been a, a hundred percent on the doing things uh, for mathematical reasons with zero percent physics. Um, but sometimes you, you end up with a mathematical question that you're working on um, that's motivated by physics. Um, but ultimately when you're trying to solve the problem, you kind of lose the connection to physics. And I, I would say that's probably true not just for me, but for a lot of the physicists here as well. When you're working on research, uh, you start with a question, it's motivated by physics, but then you distill it into a mathematical problem that you need to figure out how to answer. Uh, and then from then on, um, uh, you're really just trying to solve uh, uh, some mathematical question. But for me personally, um, I would say all of the projects that I've been involved in have had some direct or less direct motivation by uh, some physical question. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so let's um, hear from Eve and then we're actually starting to get the flood of questions now. So we'll have a good time with uh, fielding all of those. So Eve, would you like to take it away? Sure, let me just see the screen. Okay, hey, um, so thank you, Adrian, and the committee for organizing this. And thank you, everyone, for joining us uh, this evening. So I'm Eve Lee, and I'm a professor in the physics department here at McGill. Um, and I'm a theoretical astrophysicist, um, so um, actually very different from the uh, other three panelists. And, uh, and the way I view theoretical astrophysics is trying to figure out how some fundamental physical processes actually interact with each other in an environment that's completely different and cannot be found on this planet that we live on. Um, so in particular for what I do, I actually study the formation of stars and planets, in particular exoplanets, so planets outside of our own solar system. Um, and the planet formation really begins from the formation of stars. So stars form in clouds like this. This is an actual scientific image. So I'm very lucky that I'm an astronomer because I can show a lot of pretty images. This is one of them. Um, and um, inside this cloud, there is an interaction between what's called turbulence and gravity so that there's going to be some clumpings of material, clumpings of gas and dust, which eventually collapses under its own self-gravity but as it's collapsing, it's also rotating, which means once you form a star, you're also going to have a disk of gas and dust. And planets form inside this disk of gas and dust. Um, so you got to start from dust. And when I say dust, I'm talking about something that's about a micron size. So think like the width of your hair. And you need to grow them all the way to a few thousand kilometer size rock that we're all living on right now. Um, so that's a multiple, multiple orders of magnitude in terms of the size scale. And there's gonna be multiple steps involving multiple different kinds of physics. So for example, you can grow dust grains into what's called planetesimals or asteroids, which is about um, one to thousand kilometers. 
um, by things like electrostatic forces. So this is very similar to how dust bunnies grow in your room if you haven't cleaned it for a while. Um, and also what's called aerodynamic drag, so interaction between the dust and the gas. And starting from those planetesimals, um, on top of all those forces that I just told you about, there's also going to be gravity, because now you're talking about massive enough objects, so they can create things like Mars-sized cores. And then eventually you can grow things like our own planet Earth, if again, on top of all those physical processes that I told you about, also uh, combine what's called collision mergers. So think two Mars just colliding with each other. So um, I use a whole suite of theoretical tools uh, for my research. I run things like numerical hydrodynamic simulations um, that you can see on the left, the bottom left corner um, to study how dust and gas interact with each other. I also use pen and paper calculations and uh, what we call a semi-analytic tools, which just means you just write, um, build a system of um, equations that you can solve on computer eventually. And uh, I've also, I was very lucky to work with amazing students, um, some undergrads, um, to work on uh, pure pen and paper calculations as well. So this is definitely possible even if you're an undergrad student. And then I also use physics to um, study questions like how do planets get 10 times larger in size and 300 times larger in mass? So that's basically going from Earth to Jupiter. And if you want to grow something um, that's as massive and as large as Jupiter, you cannot grow it just by solids, you have to use gas. So these planetary uh, solid cores are going to create gas and you can actually study and build models uh, to understand how exactly the planets grow in size by accreting gas, just using a basic thermodynamics. And again, a pure pen and paper calculation. And ultimately, what I really want to get at for my research program is to understand this huge diversity that we see in exoplanetary systems. So this is planetary mass versus orbital period of all the exoplanets, exoplanets that we have discovered thus far. And what's really surprising is that these planets look nothing like our own solar system, which are in diamonds right now. So a lot of these planets are way larger, way puffier, and way closer in towards their host stars. And we call them things like the super Earths and hot Jupiters. So how do we understand the formation of this extreme environment? And why are they so different from our own solar system? And ultimately, like, how do we place our own solar system in the context of the overall, um, overall uh, exoplanet demographics in our own universe? And that's the kind of things that I use physics um, to answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eve. Um, just just with that last one, we're kind of showcasing the, the variety of different types of theoretical physics that, that's done everywhere. So we've got lots of questions coming in. I'm gonna ask the first one here, um, just taking a part of it since a lot of it was answered implicitly already. Um, how often do you talk to your experimental colleagues? Uh, anyone wanna go first? Uh, never actually, <laughs> I think <laughs> for my field. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, in my case, um, I, I try to get the information from the papers they write, but sometimes um, what they write is not clear and, and then I have to get in touch with them and, and ask for details. Uh, so that happens actually rather frequently with the big CERN collaborations, uh, ATLAS and, and CMS. And, uh, usually they're pretty good about getting back to people and uh, answering their detailed questions. So uh, I think there's, uh, there's good back and forth there in the particle physics community. Okay. Uh, Sarah, Eve? Uh, my research isn't really uh, tied to experiment, but I view talking to colleagues in fields that are a bit afar from me as kind of a similar thing. So like maybe a a uh, hardcore number theorist for me would be someone to talk to uh, to provide uh, me background or data and um, you know about questions that I'm thinking about. But uh, mm -hmm. um, but talking and of course talking uh, casually to experimental colleagues is something I do pretty often, but not directly mm -hmm. for research. Nice, Eve. 
Um, so I guess for astronomers, it's more like observational astronomy because we can't experiment any of this, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and I actually talk to them probably more so than I talk to my theorist colleagues because my uh, my research is very much uh, grounded in observations. So like I like all my research um, questions are based on like, what we observe and the trends that we see in those observations. Um, so I probably, yeah, I, I think I actually talk to them more than I talk to my theorist colleagues. Okay. So again, a variety of, of responses there. So uh, another question here is, um, I've heard that, um, I've heard some people say that physics is stuck and that, you know, uh, 50 years ago, there was lots and lots of uh, uh, great research going on and people learning lots and lots of new physics and that that's all slowed down and physics is now stuck. Uh, do, you, do you share that view? Uh, no, um, I think that it, there's a lot of innovation in physics now. And um, the obvious thing I could say is that there's been, you know, fruitful collaboration between physics and math for a long time in my research. But um, I guess I'm guessing that's not the spirit of the question. But I'd like to speak up for um, one area that's not represented here, which is uh, theoretical condensed matter physics. Um, which is um, which is undergoing a, a wide range of interesting developments over the past few years, um, both like at the basic research level and the applied level. Um, so the idea of um, the topological phases of matter, and, um, new phases of matter that can be used or developed for quantum computing, um, math also mathematical uh, uh, structures on the formal side of theoretical condensed matter physics uh, have been very important. Um, and uh, a host of new dualities that have been uncover uncovered, new like lattice systems that behave quite strangely, which, uh, which have these kind of excitations, which aren't what which aren't like particles. Um, so condensed matter physicists call excitations in solids quasi-particles if they behave similar to particles. And there are new phases of matter that have these exotic things called fractons that have recently been uh, discovered by, uh, by uh, physicists who are studying exotic lattice systems. Um, so, um, so that's one example and I'll let the other um, people speak to the, the other fields that are already represented here. Oh, I could say something. Um, I, I think that uh, maybe we got spoiled at some points in history by having these big dramatic revolutions that, uh, that changed physics radically in a very short period of time. Whereas uh, the thing that's happening these days is that we're having kind of slow and steady progress. But uh, to me, the, the good thing is that it's steady and that every year, practically, there's something pretty dramatic that gets discovered. Like uh, last year, it was the shadow of the, uh, the black holes, the supermassive black holes. And then before that, it was the LIGO gravity waves. And uh, so I, I think we're seeing a lot of uh, exciting progress and it, it's coming at a steady pace. And uh, I think that's uh, a healthy way for science to proceed. Eve and Goy, any, anything to add? Yeah, uh, I think I agree with Sarah and Jim, um, especially from perspective of a graduate student where you know when you start, you have to read up on the literature beforehand. And I can tell you that there's definitely a lot of stuff that had happened in the past 40 years that you, as a new graduate student, you have to catch up on. Um, and so the statement that physics is kind of stuck, um, I strongly disagree with that. Um, I do have to agree with um, Sarah about the statement about condensed matter. Um, I think one aspect of this is that a lot of the bigger experiments that people often talk about, like the LHC or astrophysics require a lot of funding and therefore the experiments that need to be constructed are very uh, cost 
are very costly. So then progress appears to be slower. But I think in fields like condensed matter, where there's you know, where quantum computing, there's a lot of progress that's being made. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with uh, everything that the other panelists said, and I I think I have like one thing to add. Um, it's just that in history, it was basically um, thus far the discovery was made by like one person, like one genius. But these days, it doesn't work like that. It's more like there's a huge team effort, and um, as Ankoy uh, alluded to, this requires a lot of funding. Like the kind of questions that we ask were so big that it requires a lot of funding, lots of personnel, and a huge group of international teams. So it's a very different mode of discovery, and it's not like the physics is stuck. It's just that um, uh, the scale of the discovery that's being made is much different than before. So um, it is actually natural, in my opinion, that things are moving at a slower pace, but like once it's done, it's gonna be huge. Like as Jim said um, about those, uh, uh, the, uh, the, um, uh, the imaging of the disk around the black hole, um, as well as the uh, LIGO. And like, there are so many like other discoveries like uh, soon to be made, like, especially in the astrophysics community and also in the exoplanet community related to um, maybe like life outside of our own earth. Great. Um, so I'm going to combine two questions here, um, which is, uh, how much time do you actually spend computing stuff for solving math problems versus reading versus meetings versus teaching versus all your other obligations? And is, do you think that's different than say what the life of a theoretical physicist might've been say 50 or hundred years ago? Gonna, um, I'm gonna pick uh, Sarah to start start this one off since you smiled at that question. <laughs> sure. Um, um, let me see. I well during the term I spend quite a while teaching. Um, maybe I don't know. Maybe half my day with teaching and administrative stuff and then the other half with meeting and talking to students and colleagues and maybe not a lot of time alone computing stuff. I imagine it's pretty different for Ankoy since he's a graduate student and it's different for postdocs and it's probably different for older professors. I'm an assistant professor right now. Um, um, what else? Oh, well, versus 150 years ago, I'm not sure. I imagine there's less, <laughs> there was a lot less time spent on uh, administrative stuff or teaching. Um, there are probably a lot fewer people doing theoretical physics as well. Uh, I don't know. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure about the, the, yeah, the motivation of or like what the, the, the asker was getting at with respect to that. So I'm not sure, sure how to answer, but. Okay, but that's a, that's a, yeah. that's a great response. And so in the, in, the interests of, uh, in the interest of moving through more questions, I'm actually gonna move on to another one and redirect this one. So uh, one question is, um, how does a theoretical physicist work during a pandemic? Do you actually prefer to have this sort of online remote uh, work at home thing or, or is it still important to you to have a sort of face-to-face -face environment? Um, how about Jim? Uh, you know, I would say it's been surprisingly good. Uh, since this thing started, I've given a couple of webinars in Europe. And uh, so I've been, uh, I gave one in S Slovenia uh, just last week. And uh, I don't think I would have traveled there to give a seminar. So uh, mm -hmm. it was pretty nice and convenient to just roll out of bed and uh, be able to uh, give a seminar to people who were interested in, in hearing about a, a recent paper. Um, as for face-to-face, -face, of course, uh, you know, Zoom, you still do see the faces. So it's not so bad. I, I think it's our uh, experimental colleagues who are really suffering much more. and. Uh, and us theorists, uh, I, I feel like we're able to function ex extremely well with uh, within these limitations. Mm 
And okay. in fact, uh, you know, since I haven't had to spend a lot of time commuting, uh, I feel like my productivity has gone way up too. <laughs> hmm. All right. Thank you. Um, so another, uh, let, let's, let's make this a, a quick thing um, for all of you, if you, if you do have an answer to this, which is, what is your favorite physics adjacent science fiction story or series? I just read a series called The Fifth Season and it was really good. I don't know if it's physics adjacent or not. Okay. <laughs> I don't read a lot of science fiction though, in general. So. Okay. Jim and Koi, Eve? Uh, I'm gonna have to pass on that one. Yeah, I don't have much to add. <laughs> Um, I also don't read too many science fiction, but uh, the latest one that I actually liked was The Three Bodies. Okay, yeah. Um, wow, I am, I am apparently the only person here who, who would like science fiction. Um, I love, yeah, just to jump in, not that I'm a panelist, but, you know, I, uh, Three Body series I thought was great. Um, I love all the classic um, Isaac Asimov robot stories, you know, I, the kind of the, the rigid logic of that, uh, of the three laws of robotics almost reminded me of physics. Um, so I really enjoyed that personally. But, you know, good takeaway here. Apparently not all, all theoretical physicists read science fiction. Um, uh, I mean, one of my favorite books is Brave New World. Oh, great, mm. shout out to a uh, fifth season. I'm on the third book, so I haven't really read the whole, whole series. <laughs> Brave New World, it, it's more bio, I don't know. That was, that was a good book. I really like that one too. So let me, um, uh, now we're kind of got about 11 minutes left um, and I wanted to just perhaps in a foolhardy way, um, raise, a, raise a bunch of controversial questions that have come up, um, which is, um, and I think uh, this is, related to the very intimate connection between math and physics um, that Sarah um, especially emphasized, which is, do you think all of math, all of the things that we can learn in math will eventually in some ways apply to physics? If I had to guess, I would say yes but uh, it might be very obscure. And I think math is way ahead of physics, especially in certain fields like, um, well, I think the, the field that's farthest ahead of physics is number theory, but we're just beginning to see some connections between number theory and physics these days. Uh, and I think fields like geometry and analysis and all that stuff are much more closely related. But I mean, that's like a philosophical question. My gut is yes as an answer. Um, and Koi, your, your work is also pretty mathematical. Do you have a view on this? Yeah, I mean, I also think this is fairly speculative. Um, I, I mean, I think a large portion of the math will be used, but I'm not by no means as specialized in math as uh, Sarah. So maybe she has <laughs> a better perspective on this. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm admitting, I'm just guessing though. Okay. So you're forcing, being forced to, to choose one, I would guess, yes, but uh, it might be a very long time. Mm -hmm. but, uh, playing the devil's advocate, uh, there might be some who would question, is it really physics? Um, yeah, that's very uh, fair too. So yeah, it depends on what you mean by that. Is it, yeah whether we measured something that that's not what how I took the question to mean I meant mm -hmm. like string theory for example like do we see this field of math like imprinted on string theory I consider string theory physics because a lot of what went into it is physics but obviously we haven't measured anything that yeah confirms that so that that was how I was answering the question mm -hmm. right 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 um okay um now Another 
related question. It's about math, but isn't, uh, isn't exactly about the progress of math or anything, but a very practical question. So someone asks, I am interested in physics and theoretical physics in particular. Um, what sort of math should I study? How should I prepare myself if I'm a, say a high school student interested in, you know, eventually becoming like Anne Coy or eventually becoming like Jim, Eve or Sarah, what, what should I do? I think considering the, the introduction that I gave about my experience, because I initially wasn't interested in theoretical physics and I wanted to do more applied science at first. And so my experience really is that um, there's a lot of advanced math that will be useful and for whatever research that you'll do. But as long as you understand the basics, which is basically just calculus, um, you can get really far ahead, just basic calculus and algebra, linear algebra. And then depending on your spe specialization, you might want to learn other more advanced topics, but then those will come, I think, as you go. Especially if you, you're talking about a high school level student, then calculus and linear algebra is, is all you need. Uh, Eve, do you have a thought as a? Um, uh, well, yeah, so I can say for astrophysics. So astrophysics um, doesn't need, usually doesn't need as uh, much advanced math, unless you go into relativity, that's a completely different story. Um, so calculus, linear algebra, um, complex analysis, um, uh, differential equations, like that's like the must. You must know how to deal with differential equations, ordinary and partial. And uh, I guess that's, I guess that's it. Um, uh, to speak to my experience, um, I knew going into um, undergrad, I knew that I wanted to be a theorist. So um, I stayed away from any lab as much as possible <laughs> <laughs> by design. And uh, I think I actually skipped one lab so that I could take differential geometry, which turns out I don't need for what I do right now, but like still I actually enjoyed it. Um, so, uh, uh, so yeah, so basically what, what I just said, um, those are, I, I would focus on that like once you go into, once you start your undergrad education. Right, but just to be clear, those are a lot of what you mentioned there were, that's the, those are at the undergraduate level rather than things that you should be doing as a high school student. Exactly. Mm -hmm. can, can I say something provocative? Please. Here, here at McGill, we have honors uh, physics and we have honors math physics. And so there's a lot of really heavy duty math courses in the honors math physics. And uh, for me, for what I do, a lot of it would just be a waste of time. And so uh, my rule of thumb is to just learn as much math as you're going to need for the kind of physics you want to do. And you'll find out as soon as you start doing it what, what math that is. And so uh, that way you can avoid learning stuff that, like uh, Eve mentioned, that <clears throat> you're not going to really need in the end. Yeah, I was actually going to bring that up, too. Um, if these are mostly McGill students, I hope. Um, I think for. Uh, most theoretical physicists, honors physics is better than honors math physics. If you know that you want to be a physicist and you don't, you know you don't want to be a mathematician, I would do honors physics, especially if you want to do theoretical high energy physics, um, quantum field theory. If you're an undergrad and you're like in U3 or something, quantum field theory is a very, 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 very important class. It's more important than any of the math classes in the honors math physics program. And I think the honors math physics program doesn't really have room for you to take quantum field theory. So that's why I think it's slightly better. Um, mm -hmm. That's my opinion. Okay. Um, and so let's, uh, let's end with a slightly open-ended question, which is that um, a lot of us who study physics, um, when we went into this and we're taking classes, you know, we, we uh, were taught to solve very mechanical problem, problems, right? Like, you know, here's the textbook worked example, and then here's how you tackle this sort of problem. How did you develop the skills to tackle these larger, more difficult, more creative, nebulous research problems? And do you have any advice for, for people who want to develop these sorts of um, skills? 
Um, I'll just, or you can go ahead. I was just going to say you uh, you go to graduate school and torture yourself for years and years, uh, learning how to do it by practice. Um, mm -hmm. That's kind of the flippant answer, but uh, I think there's also some truth in it. I think the um, hardest skill is not tackling the problem, but coming up with the problem, coming up with the mm -hmm. right problem. So no one tells you, I mean, as the question sort of pointed out, like no one tells you the problem anymore, which problem to solve. And the hardest skill is to, to direct yourself and, and to come up with a problem that's interesting and important, but also something you can make progress on. Um, being able to identify some, a question that has both of those things involved um, takes a long time. And that's, uh, I think, developed over years in, in graduate school um, and involves doing a lot of reading and talking to people and, and trying and uh, yeah. Um, so, um, Anne Coy, you're in this right now. Uh, how, how, how do you feel? Yeah, I completely agree. I think the idea is once in your undergrad and even during your master's, you start with a project that your supervisor gives you. But that as you go along, you have more independence to come up with your own project. And I think, I think Sarah and Jim both said it exactly correctly. The challenge is really to understand how to come up with the right questions that are not just interesting, but also, you know, realizable. You can actually make progress and have something, an outcome at the end. So you often do start about with these high level questions, but at the end, you do have to specify yourself to the concrete questions that you can make progress on. And I think that's more the approach that I think I'm learning. Mm -hmm. uh, Eve, anything to add? Um, not much, not much to add. Uh, I, I think, uh, all the other panelists that uh, basically, um, uh, got, they got the right answer. Um, and I agree. I totally agree. And, uh, unfortunately it's not something where there's like a good answer to like how exactly you build that skill. Um, I actually, um, like going into grad school, I was super worried about that. Like, how do I come up with this interesting question? Um, like, do I have like all the skills required so that I can be like independent researcher? Um, but like, honestly, like it just comes with um, like years of work. And I guess like I'm trying to see like what exactly helped. Um, I guess being open to like the new development. So for us, that would be like uh, looking at like new articles like on the Astro PH or archive, for example. But then like, what's really important is because every day we have about 70 papers, um, every single day, 70 new papers. So you gotta have the ability to critically assess whether that result is correct. And if not, why not? And what else is needed? Um, and like for those, I guess the way to develop that is like always like have this mentality to ask like, whether you really understand what's going on. And um, like based on what you know so far, does it fit? Like, does it, does it fit your understanding? So that's actually the kind of skill that you can develop even as an undergrad. So for example, you learn this like certain things on the lecture and chances are you probably don't un really understand it. So you have to like keep like at it and like keep questioning, okay, so based on this, like, um, but what about this? Like, do I really understand this part? And if not, then um, like either just like read the textbook over and over again, or more importantly, go to office hours and ask the, um, ask the faculty members like all these questions and like just having that mentality and building that like from early on will eventually help you um, to become like uh, build this more critical um, thinking skill as well as becoming an independent researcher. Great. Okay, well it is um, eight o'clock Eastern so I'd like to thank all of our panelists once again. Thank you very much for your time and for your for your insights. Um, I would like to um, just say very briefly um, that uh, two weeks from now, um, roughly speaking, uh, we are gonna have a talk by Marcus Merrifield about the mystery of fast radio bursts. Um, fast radio bursts are these mysterious uh, bursts of radio waves that have been seen um, by the astronomical community 
uh, in many, in a huge number um, lately, uh, but we actually don't know what these are due to. It's a big mystery. Um, and so the time and date is still to be determined uh, with roughly two weeks from now. Uh, follow us on Twitter or on our Facebook Physics Matters or Astro McGill pages to keep up to date. Or you can also send us an email at outreach at physics.mcgill.ca to be added to a mailing list. Um, so hope to see all of you um, again in about two weeks. Um, but until then, um, thank you again to our panelists and I hope everyone has a, has a great evening.